Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May the things, O oh Lord, that I choose to say bring glory, not shame, to your name this day. Let the words of my mouth bring you of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This Thursday, June 8th, will mark 32 years since the transition of my father, Matt Matthews. It marks a three-decade journey for me towards healing and reconciliation. You see, my relationship with my dad was often fraught with hurt and anger and resentment. And it only began to turn towards a very cautious hope for a healthy relationship when I finally left home for college. But those few years of hope for my dad and I were interrupted by a cancer diagnosis and a journey for him that lasted only 10 months. Now, I was grateful for those 10 months. Dad and I said some important things to one another. And that short season of healing suggested to me that perhaps a better future for us was probable, even if it was no longer possible in this life. So after his passing, I resigned myself to a level of resolve and moved on with my life, grateful for him, sad for my family, but believing that he and I had reconciled. But six years later, while in seminary and within months of our son being born, my dad came to me in a dream. Well, it was really a nightmare. His previous dream visitations were joyful and full of hope. He was singing in a choir often smiling and singing something about everything's going to be all right. But this dream was intense and violent. You see, he had me in a chokehold, which is completely outside of my experience of him. You know, he hurt me with words and with indifference, but never with physical violence. And even though I was the one in the chokehold, I kept screaming, okay, okay, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. I woke up in tears, still screaming, and it took a while for my wife to calm me down. I talked to my pastoral care professor, and he helped me engage this dream, and we walked through my journey with my dad. And I told him, he said, I, I believe that I've reconciled with him in those 10 months of his cancer journey before he passed away. And he said, no, boo. OK, he didn't say no, boo. But in the movie, he said, no, boo. <laughs> you will need to engage in a longer process. Now that you're about to become a father yourself, all this unresolved and unreconciled stuff is coming up for you. And so began 20 years of healing work with the spirit of my father. And there was light, and there was good. Out of the darkness of my grief and unresolved resentment and woundedness, healing and hope emerged for me. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Reverend Carol A. Crumley has written that Genesis looks into the heart of darkness and sees something beautiful and hopeful, a creative force 
a hovering spirit and a penetrating light that cannot be overcome. I love that the ancient narrative at the heart of our tradition begins with darkness and light, shadow and sun. For I think it reflects the up and the down and the in-between of our lived experience. Sometimes it feels like the chaos of a formless void, amen? And sometimes it feels like a shimmering light bringing good vibes and joy and peace. And sometimes it feels like eh, not light, not shadow, but something between a kind of wilderness of the soul. And right there in the first five verses, we get it all, light and shadow and in between. But not only do we get that affirmation and acknowledgement, we get God, God's self in this text. I love how Will Gaffney adapts this text. When beginning, he, God, created the heavens and the earth, while the spirit of God, she, fluttered over the face of the waters. Indeed, they are present. Creative force, hovering spirit, in solidarity with the chaos and the nothingness, calling forth light. And it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning. Friends, our lives are experienced in the evenings and the mornings. Amen? And in the in-betweens. We inhabit a world and a history of ebbs and flows, long arcs of light and shadow and gray. Dr. Jackie often says that we live in a hot mess world. Now, I flew here from a meeting in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Where chaos and shadow of hatred and bigotry and injustice against our queer and trans Black, brown, indigenous, Asian, and immigrant kindred is palpable. It's thick in the atmosphere, y'all. Every system seems to be reinforced to dehumanize, from systems about education and healthcare and justice and voting and housing and even faith. The written rules, the policies, the laws, and the procedures are once again becoming explicit in their intent to oppress and suppress. And the collective consciousness, the people seem to allow it. It allows white nationalism masquerading as Christianity to take on new forms and to grow in power. If there's anything I've learned in the 30 years of ministry and community organizing, it's that the trauma that we are facing is transgenerational. It is deeply connected to the pain and injustice faced by our ancestors seven and 10 and 15 generations ago. This, justice is, this injustice is transgenerational, my friends. It is relentless. But so is the movement for justice and the movement for peace and the movement for healing. For generations and millennia even, people of courage have been standing in the need of a blessing, standing in the void, in the in-between, and calling forth light in the darkness. They have plunged into the depths of their vulnerability, their woundedness, and created the conditions for transformation and the cultivation of beloved community. They risked further exposure of their pain and trauma for the sake of their healing and for the sake of the world's healing. The mystic poet Rumi says that the wound is the place where the light enters. In today's text and in our real lives, the light enters the void of our wounds and into the darkness covering the face of the deep. This journey of healing with my father has required that kind of vulnerability, a willingness to speak truth to myself and to my father's spirit, to reimagine myself in all of my identities and to embrace with joy and pride the soft and sensitive superpowers that make me 
who I am. And the divine, the Holy One, has been ever present. They have been present in the solidarity of a village of play mamas and spiritual fathers and adopted siblings and beloved friends who have helped me to queer the light, the shadow, the in-between, to discern the presence of the divine in, lo in the love that is already and always at work in the universe. And in the stories of elders and ancestors who embraced woundedness, the world's and their own, and cultivated love, hope, and peace. When I was in my 30s, the healing work with my dad focused on how I could offer forgiveness to my father, a man who was human, who was flawed, and who was wounded. And as I entered my 40s, I was confident that the healing work with him was completed, and that my dad and I were indeed reconciled. That was until I was back in therapy. <laughs> and this new therapist asked me about my dad. And I told him the story. And I told him that I was reconciled with my dad in spirit. And you can guess his response. <laughs> no, boo. <laughs> he asked, if you have forgiven him, have you also asked him to forgive you? To which I defensively replied, for what? <laughs> he said, for removing him from his rightful place as your father. Here he was referring to the emotional adjustment that I made at a very early age to detach myself from the power of my father to bring me down. I had to do that, I told the therapist. He was the adult, I was the child. The toxicity was suffocating. It was killing my spirit. I had to do it to survive. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't make that adjustment. I know, I know he assured me. You had to make that adjustment. But the adjustment you made then is no longer serving you today. That adjustment, that protecting of your wound, your vulnerability, is still shaping how you partner, how you parent, and how you pastor. I was not feeling this therapist. <laughs> I would drive to my appointments with the intent to fire him <laughs> if he brought up my father one more time. But eventually I gave in and I took the risk and I started this journey of asking my dad to forgive me. I exposed the wound and I saw the mutual woundedness between us. And not just between us, but reaching back to his relationship with his father and my grandfather's relationship with his father. And now reaching forward into my relationship with my son, who no doubt has a lot to say about what he wishes his dad would do. And so I apologized to the spirit of my father. I asked my dad to forgive me. It was a long journey of standing at his grave for hours on end, standing in yet another void, trusting in the fluttering of the spirit and the creator's solidarity with me. And there was light and it was good and there was evening, and there was morning, another day. Middle Church, the journey continues for us all. The creation story is still continuing. The struggle continues. Freedom and healing and liberation are constant struggles. Our personal journeys of discovery are lifelong if we let them be. Our relationships with one another are an ongoing work in progress. And this collective struggle for liberation and justice that we care about so much at Middle, it too is transgenerational. In a world that is constantly changing, even while it resists change, 
it is easy for us to lose courage. Courage to stay in the struggle, to expose the wound and to embrace vulnerability. But if we have faith, we will remember that within our spiritual traditions, there are ordinary people who stayed with the wound. Ordinary people who stood in the need of a blessing, who stood at that formless void and abandoned themselves to the sweet Holy Spirit, the sweet heavenly dove who stays right here with us, filling us with love. We have the example of Jesus who stood in solidarity with the vulnerable and created pathways for collective healing and liberation. And we have the promise of the divine to be with us in the light, in the shadow, and the in-between. We have the solidarity of the Almighty, who from the beginning has extended solidarity to us in the void, in the face of the deep, and who keeps calling for light so that we may take yet another step. And it's going to be good. And there will be evening. And there will be morning. And there will be another day. Amen. Amen.